I guess it's time for send me. <laughs> A man that needs no introduction. <laughs> Well, happy Holy Day to you all. It is good to be here. And uh, the Feast of Trumpets, I really appreciated what Morgan was saying. He said some things that fit right in. Are we surprised? No. <laughs> no, no, we're not. But anyway, the Feast of Trumpets is, it is one of the most exciting of all of the holy days in God's plan. I mean, when you stop and you think about it, Jesus is going to return to the earth just as he promised, just as is prophesied, yet he's not going to return as that humble son of man laying down his life as a sacrifice for sin, but he's going to return as king of kings and lord of lords the Prince of Peace. With that in mind, if you would, please go with me to Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9 and verse 6. Isaiah 9 and verse 6. We know this. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That's his first coming. And in his second coming, the government will be upon his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I have entitled this Prince of Peace. And brethren, think about this, this title, Prince of Peace, and I'm not talking about the, the title of the sermon. I'm talking about this name, this title that Jesus Christ is going to return, pictured by this day, this Prince of Peace. He is going to show us, just as the Bible prophecies tell us, that under his rule, Prince will increase with no end. Can you even imagine that? I mean, you, we, we look around today and all I've got to say is one word, Afghanistan. This is not a political statement. I mean, anyone can just take a look and say, we need Jesus to return. Whatever the outcome in all of that is, it's not even my point. I'm talking about what's going on yesterday and the day before and today and probably what's going to go on tomorrow and you get the point. Verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with justice and with justice from henceforth for a couple of days. <laughs> Even forever, the zeal, the Hebrew word there can be translated in so many things, but in this context, it actually, it could be, we wouldn't get understand it unless it's explained, but it is the hotness. He's on fire for this. It's going to happen. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. He said it's going to happen, therefore it's going to happen. the Prince of Peace. So we ask, what is meant by this title of Prince and Peace and by just these couple of verses in this one prophecy? What is meant by this? And what do they mean for the world? And brother, what does it mean for us individually, as a family, as a community, as a congregation, that's the church of God. To answer those questions, I mean, anyone I think could get up here and we could answer the questions, but we need to begin by asking, what is peace? 
I mean, so he's going to come. He's going to be king of, king of kings, lord of lords. He's going to be the prince of peace. Well, what is peace? What is it? So, brethren, as we gather here today on this awesome holy day to celebrate this exciting event that is going to happen, Jesus returning and all that that entails, do we, and I mean we need to think about it on an individual basis, do we, do I, do we have even a clue what true world peace would look like? I mean, can we even imagine it? Could we write a paper and explain what world peace really would look like? Yeah, if we quote a lot of the Bible verses, but just on our own, can we do it? I think you're getting my point. You're getting in and you're thinking about what I'm talking about here. And so what we see is God's word, the Holy Bible, describes for us what Jesus will deliver to mankind as prince of peace, as well as there's no other way that I, well, I mean, there's a lot of ways we could describe it, but this is the way I described it. The unimaginable changes that he is going to bring about in the world as we know it today. Therefore, to really understand the power behind Jesus' title of Prince and Peace, we have to look into the prophecies describing his two comings. I mean, we could read a couple of verses here and there, and we go, oh, yeah, okay. We getting about that much of what the Bible has to say? And by the end of this sermon, we're going to have read about that much of it. Because there is so much that we can really know. That we could understand if we would individually just put our minds, get our minds in this book and meditate on, pray about it. Yeah, even duh, fast about it and ask God to show us all that is going to happen. It, to use an expression, it would blow our mind. Now, it doesn't really blow our mind, but we understand that term. So let's take a look. Because both his first and his second comings, it starts by as we just read it. It's in Isaiah 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us... A son is given, that's his first coming, and in his second coming, the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And so, brethren, we see in Jesus' first coming, he was born, I mean, I'm not going to go to the scriptures, but we know it, that he was born in Bethlehem. And then we know by the time he, in his early 30s, debate about what Actually, his age was, and that's not the point. Scripture says, when he was about 30, I wonder, are we supposed to really know how old he actually was anyway? Uh, probably not. Why would I say that? Because we don't know. Because it doesn't say. There's a reason behind that. But, but in his early 30s, he had fulfilled the human part of his mission of becoming a sacrifice for mankind's sins through his death, through his crucifixion. He didn't do it for him. He did it for me. He did it for you. He, met, he did it for all of us, all of mankind. We also know that just before his death, being brought before the Roman governor of Judah, Pilate, he asked Jesus if he was a king. And Jesus answered. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I know that Morgan, anybody who speaks, would, would like this. You ask a question, 
and you can go right to the Bible, and here's the question, and here's the answer. I love that. We don't have to speculate. The question is asked, and you know what? They asked, and he answered it. So we don't have to worry. We know. John 18, verse 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, Jesus, are you a king then? I love it. Right, Morgan? Right. When a question is asked and then it's answered, especially when Jesus answers it for us because we know it's true. Jesus answered. And it says, you say that I am a king. The real sense of it is much more than that. He's not pointing a finger back. He's not accusing. He's not any of that. Because what he says is, of course I am a king. To this end, I came into the world. I was born to become a king. I came into the world to become a king. That I should bear witness of the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Yet Jesus had just made the point clear back in verse 36 when he says, My kingdom is not of this world, meaning it's not now. So are you, did you come as a king? Of course I came as a king. That's why I came. Jesus wanted him, Jesus wanted Pilate to know, yes, he was a king, yet his kingdom would be established at a second time. Second coming. Feast of trumpets is when it begins. At that future time, as I said, pictured by this holy day, he's going to come as Prince of Peace with all that title includes. Scripture promises the peace that Jesus brings will in time cover the earth. We've read that. We're going to read it again. Beginning in Jerusalem and then going out, spreading forth until it reaches the entire globe. Everything on this earth is going to be covered with peace. How do I know that's going to be true? He said so. He said so. Jesus first announced his intention. I'm a king. It's not of this world. But I'm going to bring peace. Then he's going to fulfill his promise. Go to Zechariah 9 and verse 10. Zechariah 9 and verse 10. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and from the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river, and, and the river actually is, is the Euphrates, is what it's referring to, even to the ends of the world or the earth. One thing that I find is very interesting in describing Jesus as the Prince of Peace is we notice that he is going to come to bring peace with a sword. <laughs> that is interesting. Revelation 1 and verse 16. Revelation 1 and 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth one a sharp two-edged sword. Please understand, Jesus doesn't really have a, a, short, a sword coming out of his mouth. He's referring to the word that he speaks is the sword of the Spirit. But it's going to cut asunder. It's, a, it's what is called a Hebrewism. And his countenance will be as the sun shines in his or in its strength. The point is, with his word, he will make war to produce peace. Now, that's an oxymoron to us. You know, it's like, duh, you can't have both. He can. That's what's so exciting about this. Bringing peace to every nation because he has the capacity to deliver it. He has the ability to be able to do it. Not just to speak it. 
I mean, after all, man is not capable of producing peace through war. In fact, man can't even produce peace through peace. Does anyone know how many peace treaties have been signed, say, just since World War II? <laughs> I don't either. It's a lot of them. How many of them do you think are still causing peace? I give you the answer to that one. Absolutely none. None. As we read back in Isaiah 9 and verse 7, Jesus' rule is described as the increase of his government and peace. There will be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with justice and judgment forever. And the zeal or the enthusiasm or the hotness of God will perform it. He said it's going to happen. It's going to happen. So imagine with me for a moment what this means. Jesus will bring peace to this evil world and under his loving, open, stretched out arms to hug and to bring tight and to hold and to comfort and all of those things, the entire world will come to understand peace in its fullest extent. Remember I asked a question earlier, I had a reason for asking that. Do we have any real clue what it would be like to have a real peace in this world? And I said, no, we don't. We will and all the world will then. We get to have a glimpse of it basically starting through this holy day. Where's the rest of the world? They're not here, are they? It's not a criticism. It's just they can't see it. I understand. God hasn't opened their eyes. We are part of the early crew so that we can get it, so that we can train, so we can then teach others this whenever this is a fulfillment. Peace will increase continually throughout his reign continuing to grow as people learn to live God's way of life, that they are being taught. Who are they being taught by? You, me, us, and others like us who are meeting today in other places with these kinds of meetings. I know, brethren, we all know and we understand it today. We live in a world that is generally satisfied to have even a meager appearance of peace. No war must be peace. That's not anywhere close to what Jesus is going to bring. I mean, for the last 76 years, we have lived in relatively, in, in relatively peaceful world, and at least with the sense that there have been no world wars. No peace must, I mean, no war must be peace. Well, yet, peace in the full sense of the word is vague and it is distant to even us, much less everyone else. And we read this and we go, wow, how is he going to do this? I mean, this is so, because we don't have peace today. Because, in fact, what Jesus tells us is that we, mankind, we don't even know how to find peace. We don't know what peace is. How are we going to know it when we found it? Please go with me to Isaiah 59, verse 7. Isaiah 59, verse 7. Their feet run to evil. Who's he talking about? Us. Humanity, their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. 
Now, I understand we can, we can be here and we can sit here and we can say, well, this isn't really describing me. What about before we came to the knowledge of the truth? That's the heart of man. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not, and there is no judgment in their goings. Again, I can just mention one word here to illustrate this point. Afghanistan. And I'm using it because it's happening right now, and you know exactly what I'm saying. Again, that's not a political statement. But it's very obvious they don't know the way to peace, and there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goes therein shall not know peace. Go with me to Romans 3 and verse 17. Romans 3, verse 17. And the way of peace... Have they not known? And you know what, brethren? History confirms this condemnation of this time in which we live. And we could be saying this in the time we live. In whatever era of man we would be living, the statement is still true. I mean, you remember the first family? You remember them, right? Adam and Eve and their two sons? One of them killed the other one? I rest my case. In the last century, just, just an illustration, in the last century, we have fought two world wars and since the end of World War II, there have been countless smaller wars. Bosnia, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, just to name a few of them. I mean, even here in the United States, threats of terrorism seem endless. Now, I don't know how much you're into news, and I, this is not a pro or con, and I'm not asking for a show of hands, but how many of you heard the ranking general in the United States make that statement Sunday? What's today? Tuesday. He just made this statement. There is an increase of terrorism in the United States today. I'm paraphrasing it, but that's what he said. He studies wars. He understands. Do I take his word for it because he said it? Well, somewhat, but you know what I'm saying. But I think he may be knowing a little more than we know. And then again, as we know, wars between neighboring nations that last for decades as a matter of fact, where strife between, I don't know, Arabs and Jews and different peoples. And currently, there are a little over, this is the latest statistics that I can find, 40 armed wars are going on in the world today. 40. The reason we don't know about them, because there's no notification of them, because there's no money in it. Just research it and find out. Nations have been fighting against nations forever. 40 plus going on armed conflict. I'm not talking about just people you know, throwing rocks at one another from time to time. I'm talking about armed conflict going on now. We don't know about them, and the reason is is because we can't make money over it. Now, that's a sad commentary on our world. Are you aware there is a statue outside the, the United Nations headquarters in New York City that symbolizes man's dream of one day witnessing the end of war? How many have ever seen that statue? You know? There's this 
huge bronze image of a muscular man holding a hammer upward. Why haven't they torn this one down? This is sexist. Anyway. And, and this muscular guy, you know, with this hammer in his hand, he's beating his sword into a plow. Do you know who was the creator of that? He was a Russian. What do you think he was wanting, proclaiming himself? Yet mankind has never been able to obtain that dream. And I have a question, and I'm not asking for comments, but for those of you who have stood and seen this statue, <clears throat> what did you pray as you saw it? Because I'm sure you were. However, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, has promised that he is going to make it happen. That's why we pray, thy kingdom come. When we pray that, do you know what we're looking to? This day. This day. Now, I know there's a whole lot of stuff that's got to take place before we come to this day, the last trump, which is the day we celebrate. This is the day where we focus on, but there's a whole lot of stuff that's outside of this sermon. It's part of this day, but it's not part of this day because I'm focusing on Jesus as being the Prince of Peace. But he promised it's going to happen and I believe it because he said so. Isaiah 2 and verse 4. Isaiah 2 and verse 4. And he will judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war any more. We read these verses and sometimes we just read over what the intent of the entire verse is. Why is this significant? He's going to judge nations with the authority that no man, no man made court, no league, no United Nation ever could have or come close to cause war to end. It is because of his position. It is because he's coming as king of kings and the prince of peace. Revelation 17, 14. Revelation 17, 14. These shall make war with the lamb. Okay, so we know what day is this referring to. The day that he's returning. What day does he return? Today. So here he is at the last trump. He's going to be ascending. So we already get the picture. We already know this. And so this is obviously talking about that point in time. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. Really? I mean, we read it and we just read right over. But wow, what an understatement. And I'm not knocking John for writing because he wrote what the angel told him to read. I mean, told him to write. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. That's us. That's us, the church, the bride. Those that are, have died and those that are in the hand of God waiting for the Father to say, it's time, go down. They're going to be changed before us they're going to be changed then and we're going to be on the earth and we're going to be changed in that moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump and the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall rise first it's not really arising when you understand 
I, I, maybe I'm getting into something I shouldn't get into, and I don't even have it in my notes, but I, I've already got myself into it. I might as well say it. The Protestants are right in some, in some things. They teach, we're going, when we die, we're going to go to heaven. It's not like they think. Maybe not even like most of us think. But the spirit of the dead person who is in Christ goes up, and there's other scriptures that says we're engrafted into the hand of God. So we're, not we, because we're not dead. I don't think so. <laughs> uh, but those that have died, died in Christ. They're engrafted into the hands of, of God. They're there. They're, quote, in heaven. And so they're kind of right. They're sort of, you know, it's the saying goes, this is a phrase my daughters used to use when they were little. It says, well, it's sort of kind of, but not really. Well, and. I agree with that. It's sort of, kind of, but not really. But anyway. But here's the point that I'm, that I'm trying to get here. We read it. Neither shall they learn war anymore. Do you realize, brethren, have you ever really thought, I'm sure I'm not the first person who ever thought about this, but do you realize his first great achievement will be to bring an end to, to warfare as we know it. <coughs> the first thing. I'm not talking about the resurrection. I'm talking about us being changed and we rise up to meet him in the air and those that are with him, they're coming down and we, go, we meet him and so shall ever be with the Lord. Of course, we know from other places we don't stay there. I don't really care that there are people well, if Church of God backgrounds are actually stating that today, I'm sorry, that's not what Scripture says. At least it's not how I understand it. And so they're going to come down. I don't know the people that are going to fight him. Are they, are they going to go up and fight him in the air? I mean, you know, it doesn't even make sense. But anyway, I know that the statement is true because we just read it. It's in Revelation 17, verse 14. They're going to make war with the Lamb. It's this day. It's the first, first act that he does, greatest achievement that he does. This day is to bring about peace. He puts an end to war. And that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. I mean, think about it this way. Freedom from aggression takes more than just a one-time destruction of military weapons beating the swords into plowshares. How many peace treaties have been signed? How many have been kept and honored and going on today? I mean, you know. Uh, again, as Isaiah prophesied, neither shall they learn war any, any way. Think about it anymore. Think about it this way. When Jesus comes, all remains of war will be removed or stopped. There will be no more military colleges where people learn war. They aren't taught peace. They're, how they're taught war. No more training camps. No more military bases. No more manufacturing plants to make weapons. No more stockpiles of munitions, and yes, the list can go on and on and on. There's no need for that anymore because they're not going to learn war anymore because Jesus in his first act, day of this day, trumpets, he's going to come and he's going to put an end to it. Mankind at that time will not only stop making war, they will cease being trained in the art of war. The end of war and the training of war is obviously, at least in my thinking, obviously going to be a great step toward peace. I mean, it's going to be a bigger step than man has ever been able to make on his own. He can declare peace, and before 
the ink dries with the peace treaties, they're back at it again all too often. And having stated this, please understand, this too is only the beginning. Let me ask you this, brother. If all wars ended today and all armies disband, would you have peace personally? For most of us, the answer is no. And most of us may be surprised that I would tell you that your answer should be no. When it comes to personal peace, most of us, and I mean most humans, and that includes us because we're part of most humans, right? I mean, most humans, most of us live in a day-to-day -day numbed state. What I mean by that is if it isn't unbearable to us, then it must be okay. That's not what Jesus is bringing. I mean, I said, this is only the beginning. There's so much more to this army forced to put their arms down, and you can't learn war anymore, and they're fighting against this army. you got to put your arms down, and both of you beat them into plowshares, usable instruments. That's not, that's not all the peace that he brings. That's an incredible thing, and we could end it right here. And we go, wow, that's going to be awesome, right? Yeah, right, right, right. How many of you know people who were killed in war? Personally know anybody that was ever killed in war? I do. I was in college during Vietnam and had a roommate. First time in American history that college students were classified from 1S, meaning college student, deferred for four years until 1A, and I had a roommate that was killed in Vietnam. I have other close people. Six out of my graduating high school class were killed in Vietnam. We graduated in May, and six of them were dead before I started to college in September of the same year. And oh, by the way, we were not officially in Vietnam at the time. So yet, that's personal, right? We understand that. Most major cities have areas that are not safe after dark, right? And today, there are many of them have areas that are not safe even in daylight. What good is freedom from outside hostility and violence, armies against armies, or we may be overtaken? You know, that's gone, because I'm looking at peace bigger than just that, as big as that is. What good is freedom when we live in fear within our own neighborhoods? Through Zechariah the prophet, Jesus speaks of cities during the time of his kingdom. Yes, I know this is actually technically referring to the time that is covered by the Feast of Tabernacles, the thousand-year reign. I understand that. It starts today. That becomes a reality because it has to start today. If you don't have today, you don't have the feast. Uh, we do understand that, right? Okay. Zechariah 8 and verse 5. Zechariah 8 and verse 5. The city, meaning Jerusalem, the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. 
And brethren, the sense of the Hebrew is to show the secure state of the area. In other words, what it is saying is it will be safe for children in a way that it is not in many or most cities today. And Jerusalem is not going to be unusual in this regard, in this way. It's going to spread out. It's going to start there. It's going to, the aggression of war and everything is going to start today because it's going to make, because it's going to make nations stop fighting against each other. They're going to be beating their swords into play. I'm not saying how it's going to happen today, the, the, his return to the day of trumpets. I don't get that that's what I'm saying. It's going to be a process. But anyway, and then it's going to be the cities are going to be safe, and it's going to start in Jerusalem. It's going to spread forth from there. Go to Isaiah 32 and verse 18. Isaiah 32, 18. And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation. Everybody's not going to live in Jerusalem. Now, we are going to be changed in a moment of twinkling of an eye at that last trump on this day. We're going to be in Jerusalem. I don't know. Because we're going to be wherever Jesus is. And... His throne is there. And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation and in sure dwellings and in quiet resting places. Think about it this way, what a peaceful feeling is going to be to fear no harm or loss from foreigner or neighbor. I'm not talking about invading armies because I'm talking about even down, even deeper into society. Yet, brethren, all too often, we don't think about it like that way. We don't think about it that way. We have to understand when, he's, when we read the phrase that he is Prince of Peace and we know that he's going to beat the swords. And, and I'm not knocking any of that. I, that would be so much better. That would be so much better than anything. But his peace is so much bigger than that. I mean in both the Old Testament Hebrew and the New Testament peace. I mean in the New Testament Greek. Peace means much more than freedom from violence. It means much more than a violence coming from without, in other words, invading armies or any of that, or crime from even within our own country or even within our own neighborhood. I, I, I'm not asking for a show of hands, but just think about it. How many of you ever have, have, and I know this is a horrible thing to even to think about or to bring back up, but how many of your house has been robbed? Do you still feel violated? Probably. Well, that was another house. But do you still feel violated? And the answer is, yeah, yeah. Well, that's not going to happen. This, is what, this word peace in both the Old and the New Testament means so much more than that. Shalom, obviously a well-known Hebrew word for peace, is understood even by people who do not speak or even read Hebrew are understood as encompassing everything that contributes to complete contentment and tranquility. Now, if I ask you to, don't panic, I'm not going to. I did this in a Bible study one time. I made a statement. I said that my mother was visiting and she panicked. When I said, if I asked you to take out a piece of paper, she thought I was telling people to do it. And, I mean, she hated tests. I mean, anyway, it was, it was. So I'm not asking you to do this, but I'm saying think about it. If I ask you to take out a piece of paper and to write down all the things that would bring, you know, peace and tranquility in your life, well, that's going to be included. I don't care what you write. It's going to be included. That's included in this word, shalom. I mean, I'm trying to get this big. I want you to understand. And then in the New Testament, in the Greek, the sense of the word for peace is not just the absence of trouble. I asked some people in another congregation one time, I said, what is peace? 
open-ended, right? Tell me anything you want to. And they said, no more war. And I go, okay, thank you very much. But you're also very naive. I didn't tell them that, but. <laughs> and it does mean the absence of war. And? What do you mean, and? And they don't get it. I mean, so many people in the church for years have not really understood what he's bringing. It is everything. This is in the sense of the New Testament Greek word. It means it's the sense of everything that makes for our highest good. The biblical sense of the word peace means all that true peace can deliver to us as humans. You can go, well, that's just a bunch of words. Okay. It means freedom from war. It means safety at home. It means sufficient prosperity to be able to remove fear of want. I don't have enough money to do this. I don't have enough food to put on my table for my... It take, it's all of that. The biblical sense takes all of that. And good health. That's the biblical sense of the word peace. From both Old and New Testament. I don't know about you, but I think the word peace is a very beautiful word. I mean, just think about it. It is beautiful. And brethren, if we understand the kingdom of God, the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, and we understand the conditions that are directly and indirectly promised, then we can understand that peace goes so far beyond the absence of, of, of harm that is all too often inflicted and imposed upon another human being, however it comes about. There are many scriptures that paint a picture of life that what it will be like when Jesus returns. Now, I know this day it's a lot of picture of war ending and all of that, and all, you know we understand that, but this day continues on and it goes through and then day of atonement satan is bound that that's a beautiful time too and day of atonement is not just an inconvenience day on the way to the feast of tabernacles it's a beautiful holy day whenever you get it but any that's another thing and when jesus kingdom is established and he rules as prince of peace the Feast of Tabernacles, the thousand years. That's when it becomes the, the picture starts blossoming and we understand it. So I think that if we take a look at just a few of the verses, then it's going to allow us to see that his peace will spread into every corner of human life. So I want to look at just a limited number of verses that's in the kingdom. And like I said earlier, that can't happen if we don't have today. Now, we don't tend to think about it that, that way because we focus so much on the feast and we got our reservations. We're going to be here and we're already planning this. And I'm not saying that's not good. Actually, actually all of that is very good. It's very good. But we got to have this day first. We can't have that until we have this. And so we need to understand. So I want to read just a few verses painting the picture, the result of peace. Because the Prince of Peace brings it starting today. Zechariah 34, 25. Zechariah 34, 25. I will make a covenant of peace. Wow. I will make a covenant of peace with them and cause wild beasts cause he's going to cause it to happen man can't do that you know they take wild beasts and they train them and they put them in circuses and in 
and uh, sideshows and you know and all those kind of things until one of them turns on you and kills the trainers, which has happened more than once. He can cause it. You know, they can't make it up. They can change their nature. They can just train them to not bite me when I feed you this whatever you're they're feeding them. I will make a covenant with peace with them and cause wild beasts to cease from the land. Hmm. And they will dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. We can also see that, that God will literally change the nature of animals so they will not be a danger to us. And of course, I hope you understand, that's actually going to physically happen. It is also symbolic of the world leaders and demons. Isaiah 11, verse Six Isaiah 11 and verse 6. The wolf shall also dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. We can talk about every one of these, but this is... Now, how is this going to come about? Because Jesus is coming as Prince of Peace, and on this day he's going to start it, and then over here he's going to make it actually a, a real reality. And a cow and the, and the bear shall feed, and their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And a sucking child shall play in the hole of the asp, and a weaned child shall put his hand in the cockatrice's den. Verse 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, in my kingdom, in my government, where I live, where I rule. And where is he going to rule? the entire world, but he's going to do it out of Jerusalem where his headquarters is. Because for this reason, the earth, as a result of that, therefore the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. How many of you go into a place where there's going to be water or the seas around? You're going to be in Florida. You're going to have waters. Wherever you're going to be going, uh, I know somebody's going over to Daytona. They're going to be at a, on a, it's going to be on the beach and all of this. Think about this every time you see the water. <laughs> Just think about this. You're living it out. Why not think about these verses? I'm <laughs> Just saying. Brethren, this is going to be such a wonderful time and exciting when this amazing prophecy comes to pass. Sharing here, this verse 9 is maybe, it is one of my top favorite verses in the entirety of the Bible when you understand the reality of what this is saying. Everybody is going to know the truth of God. How do we know? All you could do is look at it, the ocean. That's, that's what it is saying. That's how you know it's going to happen because all you got to do is look and see. That's what it is saying. Ezekiel 34, go with me to Ezekiel 34, 26. We're going to read 26 and 27. Ezekiel 34, 26. And I will make them and the places round about my hill, meaning Jerusalem, a blessing. And I will cause the shower to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessings. Uh, if you've ever been to Israel, then you know this is a prophecy because this is not how it happens there today. Uh, it's another topic, but anyway, 27. And the tree of the field shall yield her fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase, and they shall be safe in their land, and shall know that I am the Lord, when I have broken the bands of their yokes, and delivered them out of the hand of those that served themselves of them. Just another way of saying I'm going to fulfill my duties of Prince of Peace. Obviously, we're not going to be able to go into all that Jesus is going to do in, the, in all the areas and all of this of, of even economics during that time. But 
let me simply say it this way. This is all part of peace. I mean, you know, uh, so many people are so stressed out over economics, monies, whatever term, you, however you want to use it. He's taking care of that. He's showing how he's going to be the Prince of Peace even in that area. Uh, when he says that he's going to provide for individual ownership of property and the blessing of the work of the hands of the owners, they're going to provide the labor and the effort. Micah 4, verse 4. Micah 4, verse 4. And they shall sit every man under his own vine and under his own fig tree. And none shall make them afraid. Why? Because he's the prince of peace. For or because the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. It's going to happen because he said so. And then probably the greatest peace of all will come from the instruction of Jesus the Messiah and how to live a righteous, holy life. They don't know it. The world today doesn't know this. And yeah, we can tell them. And they don't know it. They don't really want to know it because they got other things to do and other places to go. And because what Jesus says is, is he is going to teach the nations how to live in peace, how to live, how to have perpetual peace. And the model society that he's going to establish at his return is going to be Jerusalem. And just thinking about it, the Prince of Peace, this is going to be so inspiring that representatives from the around the world are going to come for instruction and in how to enjoy the benefits of a godly way of life. Now I know, you know, it says, and if they don't come at, they're not going to get, they're not going to get water. And I, I mean, I understand all of that is part of peace the peace process that he's going to have. That's all of that. I'm looking even a little bit beyond that. Okay, go to Micah 4 and verse 1. Micah 4 and verse 1. But in the last days it shall come to pass, and in the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. All he's talking about is my government is going to be bigger than your government, and my bigger is going to be higher than yours. It's to say I'm in charge. God's ruling. I'm ruling as Prince of Peace here. This is another way of saying it. And it shall be exalted above the hills. That's little governments. And people shall flow into it. They're going to come to it. They're going to come to where I am, Jesus speaking. They're going to come to, to Jerusalem. That's where my headquarters is going to be. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. Because the Lord shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke, and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares. And nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Psalm 72, Psalm 72, and ver, uh, Psalm, yeah, 72, verse 7. Psalm 72, verse 7. In his days shall the righteous flourish. And, and listen to this. Abundance of peace so long as the moon endures. I want you to think about this this way. This reveals the final outcome of Jesus' teaching in the kingdom of God. It is saying that peace will endure until the moon no longer shines. Is there going to come a point in time when our moon doesn't shine as it does today? 
Yes, but that's last great day, new heavens and new earth, you know. But I'm saying, you know, in our mind's eye, we can look up, we have it. Why is he using the thing of the moon? Because we can look up every night and see it. It's there. We know it's there. We know what he's referring to. As long as that is there, there's going to be peace. So what he's saying is, it's, it's another one of those Hebrewisms. It's going to go on and on and on. It's not going to end. That's another what he's actually saying. So here's the thing. Here's the deal, brother. Today pictures the day Jesus will soon return to earth. Isaiah 9 and verse 6 is where we started. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And brother, what I want us to understand, I mean, this is what I focus on today, but I want us to understand, this is not the only point of this holy day, the Feast of Trumpets. This is huge. This is exciting. This is awesome. And we can all get, you know, kind of, as the saying goes, sink our teeth into this and get excited about this. This is just one aspect of this day. However, It begins here. It begins here with Jesus returning as the Prince of Peace. I am personally looking so much forward to this day becoming a reality. How about you? How about you? As John ends the Bible, even so, come, Lord Jesus. He focused on this day. Amen. The ironic blessing. The Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, speaking to Aaron and to his son, saying, On this wise you shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. Brethren, we are so blessed to be here, to know this, and to be able to praise God and thank God that Jesus is going to come as the Prince of Peace. Happy Holy Day. We love you all very much.